Hello, I am Aprajita from Mint's personal finance team, and today I have with me uh, Mr. Anurag Chand. He is partner and co-founder at By the Book Consulting. He is an expert on taxation, social security benefits, and regulatory matters. And today he is here with us to discuss some retirement investment tools like EPF, VPF, and NPS. So let's discuss. Welcome, Mr. Chand. Thanks, Aparajita. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, when we start our jobs, very first job we starts, and then our employer they open an EPF account for us, and that is how our retirement in- investment begins. Now, not many people are aware of VPF. Though there is something called VPF, with that uh, retirement corpus can be increased. So tell our viewers more about what VPF is and who should open it, why one should open. It. Yeah. So VPF, uh, if we look at it. it's called voluntary provident fund so when an employee joins the organization and depending upon the employee strength of the organization there is a mandatory requirement for the employer organization to contribute towards the provident fund now this contribution is done at a 12% employer and then employee matches that contribution however having said that if the employee wants to basically build on his retirement corpus and wants to contribute an amount over and above what is mandatory requirement then that is termed as a voluntary provident fund now even if the employee increases his uh, his contribution there is no compulsion on the employer organization to match that contribution that is one point the second thing important aspect is whether the employees uh, should basically contribute towards the voluntary provident fund scheme or not what are the benefits around it that is uh, uh, sort of like depending upon the compensation level of an employee so typically a person who is earning at a is at a starting level of an organization he might not be having that much disposable income on his hands yes. and that ways he would be more keen on contributing towards the mandatory coverage scheme rather than diverting his income towards the vpf but as the career path of an employee grows uh, they they grow in their stature within the organization they would be having more disposable income and hence they would be having this willingness to contribute more or increase their retirement corpus to that extent and that is where the vpf comes into picture because government hasn't uh, basically said that there is any statutory cap up to which they can contribute towards this amount rather vpf can be contributed uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, at best at a 100% of the basic salary as well so uh, well, uh, this is an important point that yeah. in vpf you can invest uh, together including epf epf plus vpf portion can go up to 100% of your basic salary amount so that is important to know yeah and uh, now there is a uh, new taxation rule that uh, if you are contributing beyond 2.5 lakh in epf plus vpf then the interest component the interest income will get taxed yeah. so uh, now with this taxation rule in picture should people still invest in it because 2.5 lakh meaning about 20 20 uh, 1000 rupees a month so should people contribute more if uh, they want to or this taxation rule should they consider is it a dumping See, this uh, we need to understand what was the intention of the government when they bought these changes in the uh, previous budget see the intention was basically to curb the practice wherein very high net worth individuals were parking their huge amount uh, towards this vpf scheme and then earning a decent rate of interest now to curb that practice and because uh, government also has to invest that amount and if they are not able to uh, earn that rate of return still they would be required to basically mandate uh-huh. or meet that statutory rate of interest okay so with that uh, thing in mind the government decided okay fine let's curb that practice the employee contribution they have capped it to 2.5 see that couple of things one is uh, the amount that a person can contribute and the tax benefits associated around it however if they exceed that amount then the differential interest will be treated as a taxable income in the hands of the employee mm-hmm. now uh, many many employees come up to us and then uh, ask us this question that with this tax changes in picture should they even stop this practice of contributing more than 2.5 i would say no because uh, one thing is taxation piece the other is building a healthy retirement corpus this is one aspect the second important thing is even if we take into account the tax uh, impact the the net rate of return would be hovering somewhere around to 5 to 5.6% which is still better as compared to what one would be getting when they would be investing in schemes like savings they keep the money in their savings account or rather they uh, invest in fixed deposit as well even in that case the 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 return by the pf will be much better as compared to the return offered by these schemes and if we talk about asset allocation then we put we need to put some money in fixed income securities also along with equities so in fixed income if we consider all other option then obviously vpf gives you 
uh, competitive rate. It absolutely, helps absolutely. About uh, for 20 to 23, the rate of interest prescribed has been 8.15 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, now discussions are happening within the government as to what will be the rate mm -hmm. of interest for 23, 24. Uh, we can safely assume it would be around 8% because it also depends upon how the market Interstate has rate. performed. Mm -hmm. So it all depends upon that. But still, uh, the, the rate of interest being offered by PF is far superior as compared to the rate of interest offered by schemes like uh, uh, fixed deposit or your ELSS or your okay. even and people national savings. And people mostly aware about PPF, oh. so the public provident fund, and they invest in that. But the interest component is much lesser than VPF. And salaried employees, they have this option to contribute to VPF. Then why not? Because you get yes. closure written just as... See, NPF. for salaried employees, they have that much option Haan. available Correct. with them. For a non-salaried, they have to go towards the PPF scheme only. Correct. But for salaried employees, they can complement. So if they are contributing towards PPF, there's nothing uh, that prohibits them from not contributing towards a mm -hmm. provident fund. They can do a simultaneous contribution towards both the scheme. And yeah. as you rightly highlighted, the rate of interest in uh, VPF is far better Thank and superior you. as compared to PPF. Just to put things in perspective, PPF offers a rate of interest of 7.1%, right. whereas uh, VPF offers 8.15%. There's a total 1% difference. Does that, uh, after 15 years, it's yeah. totally tax-free, the amount that you get in yeah, PPF? That's right. Okay, and now uh, lately we have another investment option retirement tool in NPS, National uh, Pension System. Now, and uh, this option is open for self-employed and also for uh, employ uh, employees. Now, first uh, begin with uh, the benefit meant for employees and then we can talk about that. See, NPS uh, is a national pension scheme. Mm -hmm. It is regulated by a different body. Mm -hmm. PF is regulated by EPFO, which is Employee Provident Fund Organization. Mm -hmm. Uh, NPS is regulated by Pension Fund Regulatory Development yeah. Authority, PFRDA. Uh, the second important thing is uh, NPS is more kind of a very, very voluntary scheme. Mm -hmm. So uh, in case of PF, like the contribution has to be made by the employer, then a matching contribution by the employee. In case of National Pension Scheme, uh, the employer can contribute, the employee need not contribute, or employee can contribute, employee need not contribute, or both of can, them can simultaneously contribute. Uh, the Another important aspect around is the flexibility it offers in terms of the investment choices. Mm -hmm. So there is an active choice and then there is an auto choice. Yes. Again, depending upon the age profile of the person, the risk profile would be matched according to the age profile. So the younger a person is, the higher will be allocation towards equity, maximum up to the extent of 75%. Yes. In case a person is contributing in a middle age or in a older age, then the risk profile will be tad much uh, uh, less. less. Yeah. Uh, if we talk more so from the taxation side, again taxation is standing on a different footing because if we talk about uh, VPF, it's a uh, triple E scheme which is exempt, exempt, exempt. Exempt at the stage of contribution, exempt at the uh, stage of accretion and exempt at the stage of withdrawal. But uh, NPS is rather a partial double ET scheme. Uh, exempt at the stage of uh, contribution to the, again to the extent of uh, uh, 1 lakh 50,000 plus 50,000 uh -huh. additional right. limit. And the employer contribution is completely exempt, provided it is done at the extent of 10% of the basic salary. At the withdrawal stage, things get a little bit trickier. Earlier, it used to be that the entire withdrawal used to be taxable. Mm -hmm. But now the government is saying, okay, fine, uh, because there are limits around the withdrawal. Yeah. So once a person attains the age of 60, they are allowed to withdraw the accumulated sum to the extent of 60%, right. which is tax-free. And then the 40% can be kept as an annuity, which uh, you need to invest with the specified annuity service providers. And then you get pension, which is fully taxable. Correct. So now uh, let uh, I will ask a couple of more questions with NPS so that uh, we can simplify it for viewers. Yeah. So uh, employer contributes, not all employers yet offer NPS. I think just, I'm not sure about the number, but not all. Uh, but 10% of uh, basic salary employers contribute to NPS and I believe it's uh, not a part of either ATC with uh, 1.5 lakh or uh, 50,000 additional in ATCCD one. It's, uh, it's, it's different and it uh, applies in new tax regime. It is over and above. So if you it is over and above and that's the beautiful part about it part. because 10% employer contribution uh, can be made. Uh -huh. It is first taxable income. But when we go below the line, uh, when we calculate the Chapter 6A deductions, right. under the Chapter 6A deductions, it is completely allowable. So it is right. not tagged with your 1,50,000 or 50,000 limits. It's right. completely independent. 
Yeah, so employees probably when they are switching jobs and they can ask their employers, do they offer NPS? And if they do, then employer contribution is really very important. Uh, keeping a uh, new tax rate. In fact, many companies have started uh, uh, basically putting this component in their compensation structure. They've started realizing they need to also uh, promote this particular scheme. It's a very, very beneficial scheme for the right. employees. And it promotes uh, for them to create a good retiral corpus as well. So that's why we will see many companies who are looking at incorporating this particular component in the compensation structure. In fact, I think in uh, today's article only they have suggested that they, it has grown twice. The, the corporate okay. model of the NPS has grown twice. Oh, the AM uh, is really growing at yeah, faster yeah. rate. And if somebody resigns, then what happens to NPS account? Only employer is contribute, has contributed so far, now the person resigns. Now what happens to the account? See, if the employer has contributed, the employee uh, resigns from that organization. Mm -hmm. So it all depends upon whether that person is joining the other organization. Then uh -huh. he can ask his employer to basically See, contribute. Otherwise, what he can do is he can voluntarily himself also contribute towards the scheme. Okay. And that is where the PF is a tad bit different from the NPS because NPS accords that flexibility mm -hmm. to the employees to continue their contributions. Otherwise, if they don't, then the account will be treated as a dormant account. Mm -hmm. Then uh, just explain this part also. If somebody resigns, mm -hmm. now what happens to uh, an EPF plus VPF account? To, uh, to For how many years uh, the uh, corpus will keep uh, attracting interest and when will it get dormant, uh, all these aspects? Yeah, so so not many Considering people. that people, uh, it's uh, they have resigned for good for a couple of years, they are not working, they have been joined in. Yeah. So not many people are aware that uh, when you leave the organization, and you decide to switch to the other organization then you need to basically transfer your entire corpus to the new organization you have to tag it to the new establishment course people usually withdraw it people tend to usually withdraw it uh, without understanding the ramification because if a person has rendered a continuous service of let's suppose three or four years he decides to leave the organization doesn't join the other organization and withdraws that then that entire amount is basically taxable income in the hands okay. of the employer okay. the second important is even if they have rendered a five years of continuous service with an organization they leave the organization let's suppose they want to go in for uh, entrepreneurship they want to basically go in for a self-employment then they do have the flexibility to withdraw that amount if they withdraw it okay fine uh, uh, then uh, depending again whether they have rendered the five years of continuous service or not that amount will be taxable or non-taxable Okay. The second thing is, even if they are self-employed, either they keep the money in their PF account, keep earning interest, the interest uh, they will continue to receive till the age of retirement as prescribed by the PF, which is 55 years. Once they attain the age of 55, then they have to withdraw this amount within a period of three years. If they don't withdraw it, then it will be treated uh, that that interest portion uh -huh. uh, will stop in occurring in their after account. 58 years, uh, no more interest. After but, 58 years, yeah. Uh, but so far, the corpus and interest income, everything, when whenever they withdraw it, it will all be absolutely that. unless they are the two point five category of people because we see many people who are leaving the organization, uh -huh. they are mig uh, migrating for okay. permanent employment. Then in such case, again the three 36 months this tenure uh -huh. comes into picture because uh, the interest will uh, keep in occurring till uh -huh. the 36 months after that it will be treated as an inoperative account okay so in what situations this three month uh, uh, see it three is years uh, this three years inoperative cycle begins once a person attains the age of retirement which as per the pf is 55 years mm -hmm. and then leaves the employment the second is uh, of course the expiry of an employee uh -huh. uh, the third is when they settle abroad uh, they do a permanent migration so there are uh, like three or four circumstances when this will be treated as inoperative. But leaving employment and then keeping the money in your PF account will not stop the interest. I mean, that is the misconception that many employees are having. Uh, so apart from these three, four situations, if uh, EPF money is there lying with EPFO, then it will keep earning interest no matter when the account, uh, no matter fresh contribution. Yes, but another important aspect I would like to highlight here is the minute you leave the employment, let's suppose you have rendered a five years of continuous service, you leave the employment, and let's suppose there are cases wherein people make the withdrawal claim after 10 years, thinking that my entire PF corpus is tax-free. But the differential interest earned from the date you leave the employment till the date of the withdrawal uh -huh. will be treated as taxable income in the hands of employee. All right. Okay. So while employment, if whatever we have contributed, the interest component, the interest income over that be tracked tax-free. Mm. But after we resign, mm. from that on to wherever we withdraw, mm. the entire time period interest income, uh, during that period interest income will be taxable. Right. Right. That is what it is. Mm. Okay. Really interesting to know. I wasn't aware about this aspect. Not many people are. So... 
our job is to basically clear that <laughs> misconception correct it's very uh, nice that you shared highlighted this point and now uh, why people don't want to in, uh, invest in vpf or nps is because lock in period yeah. and people want liquidity people want to have access to their money mm. and precisely why people don't invest in uh, don't want to invest in vpf mm. and nps so your comments on it first uh, you explain the lock in period how long it is and then uh, should it be a deterrent see lock in period is uh, first and foremost uh, we have to understand that these are both retiral scheme mm-hmm. why the government has put in a kind of a lock in period is they don't want it, or to encourage people to withdraw this or treat it more like a savings account wherein you just withdraw it and then again put in your money mm-hmm. so to deter them they have come out with various restrictions around it and this is for the benefit of the employees now having said that the government also recognizes uh, that yes there might be a uh, time in your life when you would be needing access to these funds and that's why they say okay fine if you are having some some uh, circumstances like marriage of a daughter mm-hmm. or education or construction of a house and you need access to those funds then based on your membership so if you have rendered a membership of a, up to a prescribed period and the amount of contribution you will be allowed to have access to those funds as well okay. so 5 years and 7 years is typical uh, period of membership for a pf in case of nps it is 3 years mm-hmm. so once you have contributed towards the nps scheme for a period of 3 years you can have access to that 25% corpus and once you withdraw that amount that is a tax free amount and that so, 25% be tax free yes that 25% is tax and uh, i think if somebody wants to uh, discontinue nps mm-hmm. then again you can't get access to all money only 20% you can have with you and 80% can- so that is called as a premature withdrawal uh-huh. so one is you mm-hmm. take an advance from nps or pf the other is you do a premature withdrawal so before attaining the age of 60 if you want to basically withdraw that entire corpus mm-hmm. then 80% is uh, what is you have to put it in annuity and 20% uh you will uh, get as a accumulated sum and that annuity uh, 80% annuity will start right then or people will have to wait to turn 60 and then yes you will have to wait till because mm-hmm. you have taken the annuity you have to For basically annuity. take annuity with the authorized service providers and then earn pension income out of it ha uh, just uh, another point i would like to you hear i think uh, there is this limit of 5 lakh also if your current uh, uh, corpus acu the what you have uh, accumulated is less than 5 lakh then you will get the full amount yeah because it's a nominal uh, corpus so i think the government re- recognized that if you have a very nominal com- uh, corpus then you can withdraw this amount it doesn't make sense to invest it in annuity because there would hardly be any return coming out of it so that's why they have kept this limit to 5 lakhs uh, uh maybe in the coming years they might increase this limit as well correct and uh, about nps people have this fear that it's market linked a mm. uh, market linked interest rate and uh, it it will keep vary depending on how a uh, stock market performs so uh, again this risk factor but as you grow older i think your equity component decreases automatically yeah. so this feature of nps please explain it in detail see uh, so what 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 nps is uh, i would say if i if i try to see with other global schemes i would say uh, it's very closely related to what in us uh, they have called 401k schemes okay so uh, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a uh, you can say mutual fund but government regulated mutual fund scheme yes. wherein you invest in and uh, it helps you in building a retirement corpus now the scheme comes with that if uh, that you can get a flexibility as to how you want to invest it first of all there are fund managers these are authorized fund managers the banks like hdfc icci uti uh, who will be basically uh, investing on your behalf the second thing is uh, as you rightly highlighted it is market linked but up to a certain extent again depending upon the profile whether you uh, have uh, chosen a active okay. profile or auto profile your your uh, okay. the, the segregation of the investments will be done likewise so if you have opted for a auto profile and you are 20 25 years of age the higher uh, amount will be allocated towards the equity scheme and then to the government's bonds and the corporate bonds likewise if you have started contributing towards nps in a older age mm-hmm. the greater allocation will be towards the schemes like government uh, bonds and corporate which are much more safer instrument as compared to equity mm-hmm. uh, but we we all know that uh, if a if a uh, investments is being done in a market linked or equity then of course the rate of return will be a tad bit higher as compared to your normal saving instrument but i think average wise it, it comes uh, somewhere around 10 to 12% as we have seen in the track record for the five uh, past years and i think investors also get an option to choose between aggressive moderate 
yeah uh uh-huh. so that option is there uh, along with active and absolutely active and active. and the beautiful so, part about it is even if you have opted for one option you have the right. flexibility to make that switch as well of course there will be some uh, switch related charges but again it is quite nominal as compared to what is being charged by mutual fund and uh, other other financial managers which so is a very nominal amount and that's why uh, we say it's a very very flexible scheme wherein you have the liberty to do all these uh, sort of like uh, moderations and uh, uh, exercise of the options so it's like pfrd they are doing the job of being a financial planner and they are doing it for you that is how the scheme uh-huh. has been structured in fact uh, we are hearing a lot of uh, uh, things wherein they are saying they might come up with a scheme wherein they would say okay fine mm-hmm. let's uh, let's uh, make it a tad bit similar to pf and give a minimum assured uh, rate of return on nps so that kind of uh, schemes are also being discussed uh-huh. so we cater to conservative uh, uh-huh. investors okay. Uh, yes and now uh, finally uh, according to you what how to create a retirement portfolio for a salaried employee so an ideal retirement portfolio and how should they go about it having a uh, proper asset allocation and reaching closer to retirement then how to see i would say my 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 advice or recommendation to employee uh, 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 group would be to first and foremost start early once they get employed of course start investing early in this retirement corpus the second is again depending on the organization you're working for if they are basically promoting pf and ps go in for both the schemes again keeping in view the disposable income you want to have because you have to basically manage your family affairs as well uh-huh. so keep that aspect in mind but do invest because these are schemes uh, uh, we have to basically remember the power of the compounding as well so because you if you start early then it will help you in maintaining the healthy retirement corpus as well as protect your your corpus from the inflation adjustment as well we know the inflation is a tad bit higher right now so in order to protect your investment you have to basically keep on investing in schemes like nps and uh, pf plus at the same time there are many organizations who also go in for a super annuation fund as well so if employees get that option they should exercise that option that is another good scheme uh, that is there i know that many organizations are not offering super annuation but again Uh, it's a, it's a good scheme which helps in building a good retirement corpus so what is uh, exactly what super annuation super annuation scheme is uh, something which is uh, uh, basically you won't find any separate or dedicated legislation around it it is all governed by the income tax regulation okay. so employer basically contributes uh, around 15% of their salary employer can make a contribution towards super annuation mm-hmm. and it is tagged with a limit of 7.5 lakhs only so employer contribution pf 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 and pf yes so employer contribution to pf and ps and super annuation cumulatively cannot exceed 7.5 lakhs uh-huh. in a in a in a fiscal year it can exceed but uh, in if it exceeds then uh-huh. the uh, delta portion will be treated as That's perquisite income in the hands of the employee and that incremental rate of interest will also be treated as uh, uh-huh. uh, income in the hands of the employee but this is another scheme which is there not uh-huh. quite popular not many people or organizations are doing it uh the the old organizations like tatas and uh, renaissance uh, we used to have this scheme this might still be running that scheme and this has to be approved by the commissioner of income tax then it is treated like a approved superannuation fund correct so i think if uh, we uh, look at it in phases then if somebody starts working then they start with epf when they have uh, probably some amount to uh take out then it, they may go to vpf and then gradually moving to nps yeah. and then s- Uh, some bit of equity component also any that's equity good. mutual fund along that's with it and then uh, that's how closer to um, their retirement they will have this fixed income portfolio of epf plus vpf and then nps will also be closer to fixed income because their in equity component will start decreasing closer to retirement and then they also have equity portfolio so best of all they at the same time look at other schemes like uh, the government has rolled out very good scheme like sukanya samriddhi is a very good scheme uh-huh, you have a female uh, a daughter Huh. uh basically a daughter then uh, then such a case sukanya somebody this scheme is another uh, which and, also, it, and then there is a senior citizen schemes as well huh. so uh, do look at things in totality and then accordingly allocate your portfolio to this different different schemes right right uh thank you so much anurag uh, you have shared really interesting uh insights and uh, i hope you also enjoyed our show so our message is that start your investment for retirement as early as possible and don't focus on a higher in hand salary you need to invest for your retirement then epf epf and nps these are really great investment tools that you must make use of thank you